Hebrews 12, 18 to 24, page 1069 in the Pew Bibles, page 1069. Uh, This is a passage we'll be reading each week as we do this series on church. And uh, so if you sit in the same seat each week, just whack a bookmark in now and you'll be able to find the reference next week pretty quickly. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 18 to 24. For you have not come to what could be touched, to a blazing fire, to darkness, gloom and storm, to the blast of a trumpet and the sound of words. Those who heard it begged that not another word be spoken to them, for they could not bear what was commanded. And if even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned. And the appearance was so terrifying that Moses said, I am terrified and trembling. Instead, you've come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to myriads of angels in festive gathering, to the assembly of the firstborn whose names have been written in heaven, to God who is the judge of all, to the spirits of righteous people made perfect, to Jesus, mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which says better things than the blood of of Abel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, you've got a sermon outline there in your newsletters. Uh, There'll be an opportunity to ask questions at the end. We had four or five questions last week. Uh, My mobile's up the back, so if you're on the live stream and you want to text through a question, please do that. We had one of them last week. And uh, this is the second in our series on church. And this week we're looking at the question, who makes or who builds the church? Uh, One of the things that I loved about living in Wee War uh, was that I got to meet the people who built the church. Uh, You don't often get to experience that in a bigger urban centre. Small towns are like that, aren't they? You get to meet the people who made the buildings, or at least their close relatives. Uh, I loved sitting and chatting with Charlie Schwager. Uh, Charlie's family had provided all the cypress pine from their timber mill out in the scrub for the church hall. I remember sitting and chatting with Gwen Fogarty about the hymn board that her family donated, which is still used in the church. As I moved here to Narrabri, I remember in 2019, as we had to do a bit of carpeting in one part of the church premises, I met the guy who was connected with the mob who laid the original carpet. He said, I recognise that carpet. And I've had the pleasure of meeting someone like Terry and the advantages that he's brought is he's put up buildings and decks at vicarages. I love meeting people face to face like that. People who you get to enjoy the the fruits of their labour. But Penny raised a really important question. Who actually built this church? Who actually built this church? I remember last week we looked at the question, what is the church? And Penny's reminded us in the kids' talk of the definition that we came up with. Church is the physical gathering of God's people in one place at one time by God, around God, with God. Remember we saw that that came from that Greek word ecclesia, uh, which would have meant uh, for the people who originally read it, all the alarm bells came on. We know what this is. This is the official gathering of the people who are part of, of the community. This is the official gathering, and that's God's people gathered in one place by God to meet with God at one time. We saw in Hebrews 12 that that was not only the vision from the past at Mount Sinai, but the reality in heaven now, and that that reality in heaven now is the template for what we do here in Narrabri. But who builds that church? Who gathers a mob that can look God in the eye? who gathers that community together. We're going to look at that one today. Let me pray, and then we'll dive into some passages. Father, thanks for your word. I thank you that we can read it. Uh, Father, as Penny's reminded us, it's not always easy. Uh, There are some really tricky ideas and some confronting concepts. Uh, There are areas of culture we've got to get familiar with that still apply today. Uh, Father, help us as we sit here with fans going, windows open, with Bibles in front of us, to think clearly about who builds your church. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm at point two on the outline. Uh, When we phrase our question slightly differently, remember that phrase, who can gather a mob to meet with God? We actually realise that there's a fairly significant problem, almost insurmountable. Last week I described it as the elephant in the room. 
Remember last week as we looked at Hebrews 12, we saw that there was a change in church. And what was the vibe when they met at Mount Sinai? It was the vibe of fear, wasn't it? Fear and terror and dread. And then we saw that the eternal church, that vibe's not there, is it? And there's a change somewhere along the lines. And that change involves the very thing that's common to all of us, but which separates all of us from God. And that thing is sin, isn't it? You see, the heart of the question of who builds the church is actually the problem of sin, isn't it? I remember Penny reminded us of that definition. Sin is the attitude and action that says, I'm God and God's not. It means all of us are pretenders, aren't we? All of us are gods in our own lunchboxes. All of us want God's job because we think we can do a better job than God of being God. And what does that bring? God's just and right response. Go ahead, have a go. And that inevitably leads to the judgment of death as we separate ourselves, as we are separated from the one who brings life. Psalm 5 verse 5 reminds us that God cannot stand sin or the sinner in his presence. It means we're standing on our own two feet, left up to our own devices and desires. None of us can stand in the presence of God. That's a bit of a problem when it comes to church, isn't it? So the, the question of who builds the church becomes a far more important question of who's going to do something about that thing that stops us, that thing called sin. Psalm 51 verse 4 begins to point us in the right direction. Read that psalm. We've heard a sermon on that psalm in the last 12 months. It's a great psalm, that great poem by David. David's been reminded that he's committed adultery with Bathsheba. He's murdered her husband. He's used the machine of the state to hide his sin. He's lied and he's abused his power. And as he meets his sin, he writes a poem about what he needs. And in Psalm 51 verse 4, he says, Against you, you alone, have I committed this act, God. That's what sin is, isn't it? Sin is sin because it's committed against who? It's committed against God. God is the one offended by sin. God is the one who judges sin. That means who can deal with sin? God alone. So do you see how our question has moved? Who builds the church is now, what's God going to do about my problem? Because only God can do something about it. That's where we are as we begin to deal with this question. And if you listen carefully to that reading that Penny brought us from Matthew's biography of Jesus, I'm at point three on the outline, we had a very simple answer, don't we? Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, this is Jesus. On this rock I'll build my church. Who's the builder? It's Jesus, isn't it? I will build my church. Very clear answer. We could stop there and it would be a really short sermon, wouldn't we? Would we actually understand what he was saying? Because we need to dive a little deeper into it, don't we? When Jesus says, I will build my church, what is he really saying? I want you to listen again to that reading from Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18. Instead, you've come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to myriads of angels in festive gathering, to the assembly of the firstborn whose names have been written in heaven, to God who is the judge of all, to the spirits of righteous people made perfect, to Jesus, mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which says better things than the blood of Abel. How was Jesus described there? Did you get it? He is the mediator. Now we're starting to get an answer to our question, aren't we? He's the mediator. God deals with our sin by sending Jesus to be the mediator. Uh, I like current affairs. Uh, I like following politics. Uh, I like international affairs. And uh, one of the things that really saddens me about international affairs is how often mediators fail. Uh, In 2014 in Switzerland, the United Nations hosted a really significant conference It had the backing of the United States and Russia, and it was a conference to mediate a peace in Syria. 
Remember Syria? The civil war is still going on. God's people have been decimated in Syria. Systematically murdered. And the United Nations in 2014 decided that they would try and mediate a peace. What I've just told you tells me that they failed absolutely. The conference was a farce. The United Nations stood there trying to mediate between two groups of people that pointed fingers, that accused each other, uh, that just talked. And the mediation failed massively. And that's kind of the story of mediation in our world, isn't it? Complete and utter failure. The work of Jesus as mediator is no such failure. There are two warring parties, us and God. The issue is sin, our rejection of God. God sends Jesus to stand between those warring parties and to bring them together. And 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 tells us how he does it. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, a man Christ Jesus. Jesus gave himself a ransom for all, a testimony at the proper time. Did you catch his mediation? He gave himself as a ransom. He gave himself as a ransom. Jesus paid a price that cost him himself, his life, his existence. Let me just explain that briefly. Humans are universally entranced and enslaved by sin. We love sin. We don't don't always acknowledge that, do we? (laughs) But we love trying to be God instead of God. In fact, we're slaves to that. And that puts us rightly under the judgment of God because there is only one God. And God actually allows us to have our desire at that point. Give it a go. And what do we see about every human being who desires that? What happens to all of us? We all die. That's the judgment of God. We can do nothing about that. We can do nothing about that judgment, let alone anything about our own nature that leads to that judgment. So God steps in. But because of his great mercy, remember Ephesians 2 verse 4, God steps in and sends his only boy who willingly takes this on to be a human just like us. Well, he's not just like us, is he? Because he actually lives with God as God. Jesus is entranced with the idea that God should be God. What a contrast. And so he lives the life we could never live. So as we've just heard in the kids' talk, he gives of himself, not just a part, not just a limb, not just a minute, not just an hour, but his existence. And he steps in and his mediation isn't just standing between. His mediation is taking everything from one side on behalf of the other side. Even as that other side persists in rebellion. His resurrection tells us that he paid that judgment for us. It was successful. And then this is the even amazing bit. (laughs) Not only does he stand in and take that judgment, But as these rebels go, I trust you, Jesus, Jesus then gives them his whole existence. So he deals with two things as a mediator. He deals with our judgment and then he gives us all of his perfection. The United Nations would never do that. Jesus deals with our judgment. And then he gives us his perfection if we trust him. There's no talk. There's no finger pointing. There's no propaganda. There's one man, a perfect mediator, who lives what we couldn't live so he could die what we deserve, so he is raised, so he can say, your judgment's paid and I give you my whole existence. There's the answer to our question. Who builds the church? What does God do? He does everything. 
He builds the church by sending his one boy to live, die and rise so that our judgment is paid and we get all of his perfection. That means humans who trust in Jesus can come into the presence of God. The judgment's paid and they are perfect. Is that where the building stops? Is Jesus like some celestial Elvis? He makes the building and then leaves the building? Does he just erect it and then walk out? Remember that reading from the book of Ephesians that Penny brought us? We looked at Ephesians in 2019. Can you remember back that far? We looked at Ephesians in 2019. Listen to what Ephesians chapter 2, verse 17 on says. When Christ came, he proclaimed good news of peace to you who are far away and to those who are near. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. So then you're no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Jesus himself as the cornerstone. The whole building is being fitted together in him and is growing into a holy sanctuary in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for God's dwelling in the Spirit. You see, a passage like that raises two very important questions for us. What does Jesus' building look like? Is he just adding numbers or is he fine-tuning? And second, how does he do that now and what has Peter got to do with it? Because he's pretty important if we remember Matthew 16. Jesus is not a builder who builds and leaves. They're the kind of builders we like here. They build our house and then they go and we enjoy the house. But Jesus isn't like that. He's the builder who stays. He's the master builder who erects the house and then fine-tunes it because he's the cornerstone of the house. He's still there. Once a person has been put into the house, into the church, Jesus then works to build them up. Colossians 3.10 says we're being remade daily in the image of our creator. Ephesians 4, 15 to 16, our memory verse says that we're being made more like Jesus every day. He builds the church in terms of numbers and then he builds the church in terms of maturity. He's the master builder. Jesus is always building, mediating and maturing. So what has Peter got to do with it? Because we've got to deal with Peter because Jesus has been very clear, hasn't he, in Matthew chapter 16? Uh, turn with me to Matthew 16 if you've got your Bibles there. Jesus is still building even though he's not here physically. Listen to what he says in Matthew 16 verse 18. I also say to you that you are Peter and on this rock I'll build my church and the forces of Hades will not overpower it. Did you catch what Jesus said there about Peter? What does he mean? Let me tell you what he doesn't mean first, because that's always an easier question to answer, isn't it? First, Peter is no better than any other human being. It's not as if Jesus looked out across the world and went, I'm going to choose the best human, Peter. I mean, just look a little further down in verse 23, and Jesus describes Peter as the tool of Satan. It's not a great recommendation as a building part, is it? Peter is flaky and fallible and faltering. In fact, Peter's like you and me, exactly the same. Second, there's no statement here that there is an unbroken line from Peter. Did you notice that? Third, Peter is now not set in motion and left to build on his own. Did you notice that Jesus is still the builder? Did you notice that it is still Jesus' church? It's still his possession, his mob. So what does he mean? Look up there in verse 15 and 16, because there's the guts of what we're talking about if we're going to understand this building process. Jesus said, but you, who do you say that I am? He's talking to the 12. Simon Peter answered, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. What did they recognise about Jesus? Who he is. What he is. What he's come to do. Now notice they don't understand the full extent of that. That's why they're so shocked when he says, I've got to go to Jerusalem and die. But they understand who he is. He is God's promised saviour. 
They know that truth. And so Jesus will use these men who've recognised that truth to keep building his mob. And Peter is leading them. In fact, by the time we come to the end of Matthew's biography, Matthew 28, Jesus emphasises that again. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. And remember, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Jesus is still a builder, but he's sending these men who know him to proclaim that message to build the church. And I want you to notice that as they build, they're not adding bricks, they're adding disciples, wholehearted student followers of Jesus. Now, Peter summarises that in 1 Peter chapter 1 and says, I brought to you this word, it saved you and it grows you. That's how Jesus keeps building. When the message about who he is goes out, how else was this established? When people who had the same truth as Peter came to Narrabri and said, have you met Jesus? And lo and behold, church was built. It's God's method right throughout. That's why in that reading from Ephesians, it's built on the apostles and the prophets, the whole Bible. So now we've got an answer to those other two questions. We've answered who builds the church. Now we know that Jesus keeps building. He mediates and matures. Now we know what Peter's doing. He's part of the mob that knows the true identity of Jesus and goes out and tells the world, just like they've been doing ever since. Which brings me to the last point on our outline. Let me just quickly recap. Question, who builds the church? Real question, what's God going to do to gather a mob? God's going to deal with our sin in Jesus, who mediates between God and sinners by dealing with sin, and Jesus keeps maturing, building that church as that truth goes out. So here is the answer. Jesus, as mediator and maturer, builds the church. Jesus, as mediator and maturer, builds the church. Let me just close with some very simple observations. First, that means the church is beloved and costly. Don't ever treat church as anything less than a treasure, a wonder, a gift and a delight. It costs a lot to remove our sin. This is not a group we dip in and out of. This is not a community that depends on our whim and will. This is the costly possession of Jesus. We need to treat it like that. As built by Jesus and treasured by him, the church is immovable. Can you think of anything that Jesus has built that's fallen down? You can't destroy this. A virus won't remove this. Persecution will not dim this. Apathy will not empty this. It is immovable. We know that immovability because what we are doing now is what we are doing forever. Let's treat it with such assurance. Thirdly, a church built by Jesus is still being built. And it is built wherever the identity of Jesus is proclaimed. And that means that there are a number of church gatherings meeting this morning in Narrabri, aren't there? Wherever Jesus is proclaimed as the Son of God who saves us from our sins, that's where the church is growing. That's how individuals in the church grow. Can I ask you, as you lived as the people of God this week, how were you growing? Fourthly, the builder's always the same. Isn't that reassuring? We can plan for the year ahead. The builder will build. <laughs> He's going to build so long as we proclaim that Jesus is who he is. And finally, 
A church not built on the life, death and resurrection of Jesus is not a church. We need to know that. That's a reminder to us about what our guts are. So as we meet next week as blokes and the week after as women to talk about our ministry, what should be at the heart of that? The identity of Jesus. It's a warning for us as we build, a warning for us as we build. It's a guide for discernment. Who can we do fellowship with? (laughs) And it's a reminder that as we move, what are we looking for? Who builds the church? Jesus, the mediator and maturer. Let me pray. Father, it's muggy. We might be distracted. Some of the concepts we've dealt with today might be hard. But Father, remind us that it is your son who builds his church and that we are matured by the truth of him alone. Amen.